Good morning and welcome to this service. It's great that we can join together in worship, albeit from our own homes or elsewhere. We welcome especially those joining us who are not regular worshippers with Romsey Methodist Church. During this service there are contributions from members of the church and the sermon will be given by our minister, the Reverend Gareth Hill. So let's open our worship by joining together with Heather and Joe singing Guardian. We just wanted to share with you some of what we've been doing uh, in these strange times. Joe and I have been working from home for several weeks now and it's a strange mix of both singing and a lot of meetings. We've been enjoying the garden and as you can see our vegetables are growing quite well. Uh, we've got a good selection and we hope to enjoy our homegrown produce soon. And of course one of the other things we've been doing is recording songs for the services on a Sunday morning and we're going to show you a little bit about what this involves. 
So welcome to our music room. This is uh, the Acquiring Voices headquarters. I'm going to show you how we put a song together for Sundays. So as you can see on my laptop, I've got a little software program that means that we can put lots of different instruments together. I've got drum tracks at the top, followed by guitars and bass sounds and piano sounds, maybe a couple of organs, uh, and then followed by all these vocal tracks that we add on top. So I'll start with uh, selecting a drum drum sound. <laughs> And then maybe add a couple of bass sounds. Maybe a couple of guitars for a rockiest tune. A um, couple of piano sounds that I can put together. Um, and maybe a couple of uh, organs as well. And then we add the vocals on top. Then Joe spends ages putting the whole thing together, mixing it into his laptop so that everything is loud enough and you can hear all the different parts really well and just show off his musical skill. We really hope that you're enjoying the worship during lockdown. And we're really grateful that we can contribute to the church community in some way with our recordings and we're really enjoying putting them together. And this cheesy video. <laughs> Last Sunday, I set myself the challenge to do one of the hardest things I've ever done. I wanted to run 5k in less than 28 minutes and 41 seconds, which was my previous fastest time. So I set off very early and the first K was good. I did it in about five minutes, 11 seconds. But as the kilometers went on, it got harder and tougher. And I knew I had to keep my speed up. In the end, I dug deep and I did it in 27 minutes and 30 seconds. Great. But that was a challenge that I set myself. I pushed myself to do it. It got me thinking, what's the hardest thing, the toughest thing I've ever been asked to do? by somebody else. I wonder what you would answer to that question. Maybe it would be an apology that you had to make or a very difficult phone call. Maybe it was making a decision about the care of a, a relative or loved one, or maybe even not hugging your friends and your family during lockdown. We get asked only to do some very tough things but I wonder whether Jesus' early disciples and all the disciples and followers of Jesus that have come on since then have been asked to do the toughest thing ever. 40 days after Jesus had been raised from the dead, he was sat around a table with his disciples, probably enjoying a meal. And Jesus asked the disciples, in fact, he told them to go into the world and to tell everybody what they'd seen, what they'd heard, what had happened. And it would be good news to them. They were to do everything that he had done and more. Basically, Jesus was asking the disciples to be like him, to do what he'd been doing, to show God's love and his mercy and his grace, to show compassion after compassion after compassion, to heal the sick, to feed the hungry, to fight for justice, to tell his story so that others would know God, to bring heaven down to earth and to raise earth up to heaven. Be like me, Jesus was asking those early disciples. And he says the same to us, be Christians, be little Christs. I don't know about you, but that's the hardest thing I've ever been asked to do. And I can't help but wonder whether the conversation around that meal table went rather quiet after Jesus had told the disciples to do that. But there was more that Jesus wanted to tell them and more to do. So they got up from the table and started to walk up a hill. reminded the disciples what he said about leaving them soon, going back to be with his father, working from home if you like. Hang on a minute, Jesus has just given the disciples 
tackles the toughest task ever and he's going to leave them to get on with it on their own? Well, no. Let's climb to the top of the hill to find out what happened. Jesus was going to leave, but he wasn't going to leave the disciples alone. Before he goes, there are three promises made to the disciples. See if you can spot them as I read what happens from the book of Acts. Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Did you spot the three promises? One, that the Holy Spirit will come. Two, that the disciples will be witnesses to what all that has happened, and they will be witnesses to the ends of the earth. And three, that Jesus will return. The task that Jesus has left us is huge, but what he promises and what he gives us is more than enough to meet the task. He promises the Holy Spirit, the power that raised Jesus from the dead, working through us, God unleashed in us. He promises that they will make disciples. And he promises that it makes a difference what we talk about him. People will come into God's loving arms. And then he says, the angels say that Jesus will return. We have this wonderful reunion to look forward to of all those who've gone before us and Jesus himself we will see face to face. What we are given and what we are promised transforms the task that we are set. And those early disciples, well, they went back to Jerusalem with joy and they got stuck into some serious prayer. And what happened next? Well, watch this space. Hello from King Sunborn. Our reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 17. It's verses 1 through to 11. And I'm reading from the Good News Translation. And the passage is entitled, Jesus Prays for His Disciples. After Jesus finished saying this, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your Son so that the Son may give glory to you. For you gave him authority over all people, so that he might give eternal life to all those you gave him. And eternal life means to know you, the only true God, and to know Jesus Christ, whom you sent. I have shown your glory on earth. I have finished the work you gave me to do. Father, give me glory in your presence now, the same glory I had with you before the world was made. I have made you known to those you gave me out of the world. They belong to you and you gave them to me. They have obeyed your word and now they know that everything you gave me comes from you. I gave them the message that you gave me and they received it. They know that it is true that I came from you and they believe that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. But for those you gave me, for they belong to you. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. My glory is shown through them. And now I am coming to you. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. Holy Father, 
Keep them safe by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one, just as you and I are one. Thanks be to God. I wonder if any of you have ever played in a band or an orchestra. Uh, if you have, you'll know that there's a real difference between going to a concert, sitting down and, and letting someone perform to you, and being a part of it, playing your role within the whole ensemble. As you do that, you hear that the composition grows around you. You enter into it in really a different way and become part of what's being developed among a whole group of people. It also becomes part of you and you share a unique experience with the people that you work with and play with. So as you play your part, what you sense is that the combined talents of all those around you have become something almost of its own, a creation that's greater than the sum of its parts. And maybe that's a little bit like the experience of the disciples in the story we've been listening to. Uh, John and the Gospel has taken us through a series of events. Uh, we said a couple of weeks back that John 14 through to the end of 17 is called the Final Discourses. And in that we've been through the Last Supper with Jesus sharing a meal and bread and wine with his friends, washing the disciples' feet. He promises to come back for them and take them to a place that's being prepared for them beyond death talks about the work of the Holy Spirit uh, and that work as confirming them as God's possession. And last week we looked at a definition of the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, one who comes alongside to help. Well here in John 17 Jesus prepares for his last and decisive act on earth, the crucifixion and the resurrection. And John in the Gospel is giving us a unique picture of the relationship between the Son and the Father, as well as between Jesus and the disciples. It really is as if Jesus is handing the disciples over to God, handing them over and the care and well-being of them in the future. In summary, what we heard in the reading is Jesus saying, I pray for them, for those you've given me, for they're yours. All I have is yours and all you have is mine. And now I'm coming to you. So Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be one just as we are one. There's a, a series of commentaries called the Fortress Bible Commentary. And in the one on John, on John Caroline Lewis says that Jesus commits the entirety of his life, his ministry, the disciples and everything that's been said in this final discourse to God the Father. Perhaps the most crucial thing for the disciples and for us as we look at it is that they get to overhear this prayer conversation. To get back to the orchestra image we began with. The disciples are about to be immersed, becoming active participants in everything that is going on for God's kingdom. It will be bigger than all of them, but it would be impossible without them. Heard somebody say just the other day of uh, them playing in an orchestra, youth orchestra, and they were the percussionist. One piece that the orchestra played the percussionist had to wait for 128 bars before hitting the triangle once and then another 20 minutes before hitting the kettle drum once. That was their sole contribution but without them the piece wouldn't have been complete. Now for the disciples to realise that this is where God begins to involve them in the detail of his ministry they need reassurance and so they listen in to Jesus' prayer. I wonder about here in lockdown, what difference it makes to you to know that Jesus remembers you before God. How do you hear this text? 
in the understanding that our well-being is the concern of heaven that the father and the son are in conversation about people like us in fact about us what does jesus prayer show us today well the first thing i believe is that it tells us we are known by god and in john's writing the idea of knowing is not like me saying oh i know that person i see them in the shop or i know them they live around the corner but it is about being in relationship it's that they are known by god because he is their father too and it's not that we become some kind of super holy group with exclusive knowledge and access while others are locked outside this prayer is one of the beautiful examples of a relationship between the son and the father that opens up the possibilities of heaven and at the same time reminds the disciples that their concerns are held in the gaze of God too. In verses 7 and 8 Jesus says now they the disciples now they know that everything you've given me comes from you for I gave them the words that you gave me and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. I wonder how your relationship with God has been during these weeks. Yet in lots of ways there's more time, there's more time to read scriptures, there's more time for prayer. Uh, many of us now go to more Sunday services than we would have done under any other circumstance. There may be more opportunities, but how do we feel? How often do we remember that we are known by God, by Jesus? I make a point of staying as close as I can to those who know me and who love me. And through WhatsApp and FaceTime and the telephone, I manage to speak and even see my children and my grandchildren, my father, my brother, my sisters uh, and the wider family. And it really matters because in the sense that John tells us, to be known is also to be remembered. In Psalm 115, the psalmist says, the Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless his people Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great alike. And goes on to say, may the Lord cause you to flourish both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You see, to be remembered by God is not to say that God ever forgets us, but he brings us to the forefront of his minds. We are the ones he focuses on. Uh, and Jesus goes as far as to say, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. There is that sense that eternal life rests on being known and knowing. So that's my first point. We are known by God. The second is that we're invited in by God. And I'm going to use an image that some of you may know well. Uh, the artist St. Andre Rublev painted an image which we now call Rublev's icon. It actually is called the Hospitality of Abraham, painted in 1411 for the Abbot of Trinity Monastery in Russia. It's become in many ways the classic image of the Trinity. It depicts three mysterious strangers who visited Abraham. Uh, we read it in Genesis 18. And those strangers are held to be the Father, the Son and the Spirit. And you can see the relationship as you look into the image. The Christian writer Henri Nuon, uh, he has a meditation on this icon and says this. The more we look at this holy image with the eyes of faith, the more we come to realise that it is painted not as a lovely decoration for a convent church nor as a helpful explanation of a difficult doctrine, but as a holy place to enter and stay within. 
He writes, as we place ourselves in front of the icon in prayer, we come to experience a gentle invitation to participate in the intimate conversation that is taking place among the three divine figures and to join them around the table. The movement from the Father towards the Son and the movement of both the Son and the Spirit towards the Father become a movement in which the one who prays is lifted up and held secure. So as we stand and look at the image, we are invited in. And Henri Nuon says, uh, we come to see with our inner eyes that all engagements in this world can bear fruit only when they take place within the divine circle, the house of perfect love. As onlookers, we discover that the Father, Son and Spirit were already inviting us in to join that circle of love. If you look at the picture, the front where we stand and look is open as an invitation in. John himself wrote in the first of his letters, we love because he first loved us. It's an invitation of love to then be the people who show love. Remember we're looking at the story of the disciples listening to Jesus praying. This intimate conversation between Christ the Son and God the Father and we are invited in to that relationship. The purpose surely was that whatever came next they would remember that moment when the father and son were so engaged in the conversation about them that they knew that they would know that they would be kept secure and then they were invited to play their part in the kingdom God is building. Maybe you say well what difference does that make to me if I can't sit with my neighbours and share the story of faith? What difference does it make if I feel that my prayers are being said in some kind of echo chamber and they go nowhere? What difference does it make if public worship and the opportunity to be seen living out my faith appear to have been cut off? Well, I believe God still is passionately committed to us and to our part in this kingdom he's building. I'm convinced that our discipleship and witness are enriched when we realise afresh that God invites us in to share in the work of heaven. So we're known, we're invited in, and thirdly, we are the presence of God in the world, even when we don't feel like it. Many of you will know that it's Aldersgate Sunday today, a significant day for Methodists, because we remember that moment when John Wesley's heart was strangely warmed. It was May the 24th, 1738, and Wesley, uh, who went on then to found Methodism as a church separated slightly from the Church of England, was at a meeting of the Moravian sect of Christians in Aldersgate Street. And while there, he underwent a profound religious experience. Some of you will know it well, but in his journal, he puts it this way. In the evening, I went unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter to nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. This moment was for Wesley an awakening to the assurance found in salvation by grace alone, and many commentators would refer to it as the definitive moment in the Methodist movement. You see, two years before Aldersgate, Wesley had come back from America disillusioned, depressed, 
because he'd gone there with an intention to revive what he called primitive Christianity in the Americas. And it had been a disaster, really. He came back heartbroken and was sort of wondering what to do. And the road back to Aldersgate, to this revival moment, was helped by the Moravians, particularly a man called Peter Bowler. And Wesley spent time with Bowler and talked about how he felt his disillusionment with a failure in mission. And Bowler gave him just one piece of advice. Preach faith until you have it. And then because you have it, you will preach faith. Aldersgate was for Wesley his encounter with God's Holy Spirit that revived the work. And I wonder if it might be a word for us at this moment. And you say, Gareth, I'm, I'm not called to preach. I'm not called to lead a worldwide movement of Christians. That's not what I do. But it may be a word that God, through his Holy Spirit, because he knows us, because he invites us in, invites us as well to be a people who pray for opportunities to be the people of God in the world, even in lockdown. Remember, we've been invited to listen in to heaven's conversation. And then we go from there to be the face of Jesus, the face of God in the world. It may not feel that we are the presence of God, but God believes it. And so does Jesus. And the conversation in John 17 reminds us that Jesus has given our care to God and that God has sent the Spirit in answer to the Son's request so that like the disciples, we work it out exactly where we are, making the grace of God visible in our place and in our time. Amen. Good morning and warmest greetings from King Sonborn. We come now to our time of prayer and I'm going to begin with a short prayer by John Birch and then go on to the prayers recommended for today on the Methodist Church website. Let us pray. Gracious God, take from us any anxiety we might face as this day and its baggage opens the door and enters in. May we see opportunities that yesterday were missed, blessings in the little things we might normally walk past, time enough to set aside a space to read your word, say a prayer, sing a song, strengthen faith and know you're there, always there, whatever this new day might bring. God, our protector, we come before you in prayer for your world, your children and ourselves. We pray for the world that you have made. We thank you for the renewal of creation springing up as human activity has been restricted. We pray that we will learn to value these gifts and to live more gently in future. We pray for the leaders of nations making impossible decisions on our behalf. We pray that they will speak and act with integrity and protect those who are most vulnerable. We pray for our church communities. We bring you our sadness at not being able to meet together. And we thank you for those people who are finding it easier to explore faith at this time. We pray that we will find new ways to reach out to the world. We pray for the people we miss, our friends and families, and those we long to see face to face. We pray for safety and protection for our loved ones. We pray for those who have lost someone they love and haven't been able to say goodbye. We pray that they will know the comfort of your loving presence and that you will show us how to reach out in love and friendship. We pray for ourselves in these difficult days, shared by so many people, but also lived in isolation. Help us to know your protecting love and to live in the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now let's join together and say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. Today is Aldersgate Sunday, the day when Methodists celebrate the life, the ministry and the witness of John Wesley. John was born into a Christian household, the 15th of 19 children. He was educated at Oxford and led a devout and holy life, studying the Bible, often in Greek, praying, partaking in Holy Communion, communion giving alms, serving the less fortunate, especially those in prison. In 1735, he, along with Brother Charles, went on a missionary journey to Georgia. On the way over, a mast broke on the boat and the English went into panic mode. The Moravians, with whom he was travelling, prayed and sang hymns. Despite his vast intellect and devout life, John saw in them and in their faith something which he lacked. The mission from Georgia to Georgia did not go well, to say the least, and the Wesleys returned to England somewhat deflated. John writes in his journal on the 10th of May in 1738, I was sorrowful and very heavy, being neither able to read nor meditate nor sing nor pray. He kept in touch with the Moravians and they had helped him to an extent, but he had a continual sorrow and heaviness in his heart as he made his way on the 24th of May to a meeting in Aldersgate Street. These are his words from his journal, which I commend to you. In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans, about a quarter to nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given to me that he'd taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. And the rest, as they say, is history or as Gareth put it last week, MF. More follows, much more follows. Today, over 30 million souls worldwide are Methodists. The Methodist Church was started as a movement by John Wesley to bring revival to the established church. Now we have become an established church, but at the expense of being a movement, who knows? On reading this passage from Wesley's journal, one thing struck me anew. I went unwillingly. I remembered over 40 years ago when I went unwillingly to a church in Hounslow, Holy Trinity. I was at a very low point in my life. Um, I was not a Methodist, I was barely a Christian. And in that church, I sang for the first time a hymn written by John's brother, Charles. And can it be? And as we came to verse four, my chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth and followed thee. I felt my arms go in the air. I don't know how they got there. And tears pouring down my cheek. For me on that evening, I knew for certain what I only hoped for. Jesus is alive in the person of the Holy Spirit. We can ex accept Jesus in our head, like John Wesley did, but we can never really know him until he enters our hearts. 
There's an old hymn, an old chorus which I sang at the East New Gospel Mission. I serve a risen Saviour. And there's a verse which says, He lives, he lives, my sa salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. I guess it didn't mean much to me as a child, but it means the world to me now. Gerard Hughes wrote of a God of surprises. John Wesley was surprised. I was surprised. Millions of souls are, have and are being surprised by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The American evangelist Dwight Moody was once asked, Brother, have you been baptized in the Spirit? And he replied, Yes, brother, but I leak. We all leak. We all need a constant top-up in the Spirit through prayer, through worship, through Holy Communion, through Scripture, through service. Today we give thanks for, to God for John and Charles Wesley, for their ministry and their legacy. And may we, as the people called Methodist, go forward, moving in the power of the Holy Spirit and be prepared to be surprised by God, who knows and meets our every need, especially at times like this, and who loves us beyond life itself. Let us now sing our second song, that well-known hymn by Charles Wesley, And Can It Be? So free, so weird. 
joining us in worship this morning. We pray that you'll have gained something from this service which will help you in the days to come. If you want to learn more about Romsey Methodist Church then please look at our website or follow us on Facebook. Take care, keep well and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, it's not very often that we have a piece of breaking news uh, on a Sunday morning, but there is something I really want to share this with you. Uh, just in the last couple of days, we've had confirmation that Romsey Methodist Church has been awarded its gold eco church status. Uh, there are 11 gold churches throughout England and Wales, and we are the second of the Methodist churches to gain that gold status. It's been quite a journey. We started it uh, four years ago uh, and we've worked our way through a, a series of questions and we've uh, looked at how the church is the church. Um, but we've got that award. We are thrilled to bits. And it's my joy to thank all of those on the church's eco group who have worked so hard and, and enabled us to see what's good about recognising our need to care for the planet. We said when we met the eco folk online this week that this is not the end it's in a sense a springboard a springboard into a greater commitment to care for the planet and I know some of you watching this morning aren't members of Romsey but I know you've shared that journey with us as we've talked about it over the years so it's a big thumbs up and grateful thanks and very soon we'll have uh, another trophy that we can put on the wall along with our bronze and silver awards. Thank you. Take four. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Oh, right. Okay. Um, right. We'll take five. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>